In today's reading, we are told the new Jerusalem, the city walls, stood on twelve foundation stones. Each one bore the name of the one of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the church is held by the apostolic succession. The church, therefore, continues to remain strong so long as our faith is in continuity with the apostolic faith. And so, therefore, the apostles are very important in the understanding of the church's foundation. And yet, it is important for us to take note that these 12 apostles, they came from different background and different personality and temperament. Each of the apostles has their own strength, their own weakness, but together, they build the church. Together, they continue to witness to Christ. And so today, as we serve the feast of St. Bartholomew, then we want to inquire exactly how Bartholomew, or named Nathanael, can teach us when it comes to the question of founding our faith on. The great thing about Nathanael was that he was truly a man who was sincere. The Lord Jesus said he is incapable of deceit, which means to say Jesus saw through Nathanael. He was a man truly honest with himself, honest with others, a man of integrity. He does not deceive people and he does not want to deceive himself either. He is what you see. And that kind of man, therefore, is incapable of deceit. A very sincere man, like an open book that you can read. There is nothing to hide. He doesn't try to act as if he is somebody else. He was just simply himself. That kind of man, of course, not easy to find in today's world. Because most of us, we put on masks after must. And most of us do not really project ourselves as we really are. We tend to put on sometimes a good front. And so Jesus recognized in Nathanael someone who is sincere. And yet the great thing about Nathanael was this. He was a man of integrity. He wants to lift the truth. He seeks the truth, and he will not rest until he finds the truth. And so when Philip came to tell Nathanael that they have found the Messiah, the one Moses wrote about in the law, and whom the prophets wrote, and Philip told Nathanael, this person is none other than Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael was skeptical. His immediate response was, From Nazareth? Can anything good come from that place? A very honest and frank answer. Because Nazareth was a Roman garrison. Nazareth was not a place that was known for deep spirituality. And actually, the question that Nathanael said was actually a frank Response because this was the same question that the people asked about Jesus. If you read in St. John's Gospel, when Jesus was preaching at the temple, John chapter 7, the people asked, We know who he is, we know where he came from. The Messiah doesn't come from Nazareth. And it's interesting that the ministry of Jesus did not begin from Nazareth, it began at Capernaum. And so the questions were valid because unlikely. Nazareth can produce the Messiah. And so, this Nathanael, honest as he is, true to himself, true to what he believes in, and yet the great thing about Nathanael was not that simply he was sincere, that he was searching the truth, but he was open to the truth. He did not defend his position, he did not defend his opinions as if what he read, what he knew from study or from hearsay or from his upbringing, that these views 
are always correct. So when Philip said to Nathanael, come and see, he was ready to go and have a look. He didn't say, don't waste my time. I already know the answer. And so when Philip invited him to come and see, he went. And that's a great thing about someone who, although has already an opinion on something, yet is still open, still receptive, still docile. He was open to learning, open to discovery. He was not afraid that if he were to go and then proven that Jesus was truly the Messiah, then he will lose faith. He was not afraid. He will have to withdraw his command about Jesus. He had the courage to go and see. And I think this is something very important for us all, especially in today's world we live in. All of us, no matter who you are, we are somehow conditioned by our upbringing, by our past experiences, by our studies. And so we already have a mind of our own on certain aspects of things. And when people try to tell us something that is not in agreement with what we said, we tend to be defensive. We tend to insist that we know the truth. And that is closing ourselves to the search for truth. And it's good also to ask ourselves, why are we afraid to learn? Why are we afraid to hear of something that is different from what we hold? Especially something you hold dear to you your whole life. Especially if you talk in terms of conversion, those who are from another religion and they hear about Jesus, I mean, for years, you know, I've been worshipping this God or I've been following this religion and now you come and tell me about Jesus. It takes great courage, actually, to say maybe perhaps what you say is true, what you say is right. And most of us, actually, we have our fears of opening ourselves to another perspective that is offered to us. We try to defend ourselves and we prefer to live with the views that we have held all these years for fear that the moment we give up this perspective, our whole life will collapse because sometimes our whole life is built on certain pillars, something that we held so closely to. When these are broken and when these are destroyed, we've got nothing to hang on to. It will be terrible. And that actually is often the case even after church. You know, when we think of church scandals, people have great faith in our priest, great faith in the church as well. And so when they see church leaders not living up to their calling, their whole faith collapsed because their whole faith was founded on this father, this bishop, or these doctrines. And when they are being challenged, their foundation is weakened. And we can understand why when someone is challenged in his faith, the moment he loses his faith because of some things that happened in the church, when the priest scolded the parishioners uh, in front of the whole assembly, the parishioner is so embarrassed and so hurt, wouldn't go back to church anymore. Because the whole idea of the mercy of God, and the Father is supposed to be loving, to be compassionate, and to be understanding, all gone. And there is nothing for them to hold on to the church. And everything gets destroyed. And this is so true also when we talk about the synodal process as well. It's the same kind of challenge. Today we know the church is going through difficult times because of a changing trends in the world. And the bishops, the gardeners and the Holy Father are finding ways to deal with these modern trends, trying to make the church relevant at the same time, trying to keep the church in continuity with the foundation of the apostles, the apostolic faith. How do we put these two together? It's a real challenge. And that is why there are a lot of ambiguities also in the church today. In the past, things are so clear. Until the 18th century, I tell you, the whole problem came after the 18th century, the so-called Enlightenment period, when modernism came in. When Descartes came in, I think, therefore, I mean, all these questions started. When the philosophies of the Western world, the modern philosophy, questioning. And before that, when we were still with St. Thomas, everything was black, 
or white. Things were clear. No such thing as a grey area. Mortosin, venusin. Now, I don't know what is a mortosin anymore. How do you classify venusin, mortosin? becomes so confusing. And you know, I remember when I was young, you school backwards, go for confession, mortosin, cannot receive communion. Nowadays, it's hard to tell. So, life has become relative. So, the Holy Father, in that synodal process, is trying to get the church to read the signs of the time together, to listen to one another. How do we move forward? And so today, we are called to be like Nathanael, be open, be discerning. And this calls for humility. Without humility, it is very difficult. So humility is the prerequisite for docility, openness. Humility means to say, I might not have all the answers. Humility means to say, maybe somebody else has the answer. And this is what the Holy Father is asking, especially the priests, the religious, you know, that this you know, process, don't just hear from the fellow priests only. We want to hear the people because the lay people got the different perspective. Because the Holy Spirit speaks to the whole church. Let us try to listen. At the end of the day, we need to make some decisions, but let us listen widely. And then we try to discern where is the Spirit leading us. But it takes courage to listen. It takes humility to listen. And is that humility forthcoming? Whether priests are religious are willing to listen to the people, whether the lay people among themselves, the leaders are willing to listen to each other, it's called for humility. So humility, therefore, is a prerequisite, or else we cannot learn. So that's why as a leader, although we have our views, we have our standpoint, but I think as a leader, we must always enter into dialogue as if we are little children. So humility is, of course, of great importance, but humility is still not enough. We have to learn from Nathanael eh? because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. So the fig tree is a symbol of contemplation, a symbol of deep prayer, a man who is in union with God. So he was sitting under the fig tree because he was genuinely seeking for God. When Jesus saw Nathanael under the fig tree, he said, this man is really, truly searching for God. He was a man of prayer. I think we talk too much, but we don't actually pray together. We don't really put all our discussions in the context of prayer. I think that is what we are lacking. A lot of debates, yeah. But it's not a prayerful kind of debate. It is not in the context of prayer, in the context of divine providence, and always bearing in mind that we are here to give glory to God for the good of the gospel.